Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Clinton and Dr. Anderson, for your presentations. Um, I think this project is, is a great example where um, there was a, an immediate need in the livestock industry, in this case mainly the swine industry, um, needs some immediate solutions, um, but also at the same time look at what is the cause so that long term we can address it. Um, presented a lot of information today and I know that this only is part of the project as well. Um, we have several questions come up. If additional questions come to mind, please don't hesitate to add them to the Q&A. Um, so I'll, I'll start off the questions. I'm not going to go quite in order, um, but I thought I'd start with some about that relate to the, the incidences of pit foaming. Um, some of this might be based on some of your surveying work and some of it just might be based more on your perceptions. Um, so Dr. Clanton, I'll start with you. Was there any um, relationship or is there any, are there any thoughts regarding pit agitation and the amount of foaming? Uh, just flat out pit agitation. Um, the, uh, well, I guess the, uh, the first thing I'd have to say is that I don't know of any producers that agitate during the middle of the year. All the agitation is done um, right before you want to pump it, you know, for a few hours or maybe overnight in which there's a sudden release of, of gases. Um, and by that time, it's really, it's too late. And it's the old recommendation. We want to have all the animals out, and definitely all the people out before you start agitating. So the way I would answer that is I don't know of any relationship between agitation and, um, uh, with, with equipment. Now, David Schmidt, he was kind of one of the first instigators on this. And he said that there was some natural mixing and, uh, when they got that natural mixing in there, I can't remember if that was a result of the foam or not, but he was noticing that difference that Dan brought out there on the homogeneity of the uh, material or not. So, but anyway, the bottom line is, as far as I know, no relationship between foaming and agitation. Great, thanks. Um, similarly, um, and I'll throw this one to, to Dan if, if you have an idea, um, I know, most of us are engineers, so this might be a little bit out of your wheelhouse as well, but is there any diet management techniques to help mitigate foam generation? I won't promise you any mitigation technique that will stop it, but there are certainly diet changes that change our foaming characteristics. Uh, one of the things, we did four diet studies. One of them focused on proteins, and then the one I showed you where we had different grind sizes and different fiber substrates. So when I look at the mechanism of foaming, one of the things that I, I tried to bring out was that we have an emulsion and that protein's important. Uh, in our diet study, one of the, our protein study, one of the things we did was feed different levels and different sources of protein. Uh, what we saw there is that higher protein levels tended to have manures that had higher foaming characteristics. So one of the things you can do in terms of diet management is trying to re reduce that protein, try and feed less ex excess protein. The other thing I tried to bring out was uh, in that uh, grind size study was that the amount of carbon that we're loading into the pit is really important, right? That's food for our microbial system. And certainly just because we're feeding potential to that pit, right? Methane potential to that pit doesn't mean it develops and turns into methane, uh, but it's potential there. Uh, so trying to choose feed substrates that are more digestible. Uh, can make a difference, right? And I'm not here to pick on DDGs. We did feed some diets that could cause uh, foaming just as much as DDGs would. It just, in this case, one of the higher fiber substrates is less digestible that's commonly used, tends to be DDGs, and that tends to add more carbon to the pit as well as protein. Uh, but there have been some changes in how that's processed with and without oil, and I really can't answer how that may impact our foaming potential. Thanks, Dan. Uh, in a follow-up to that, there was a question also about, um, and maybe it ties into the study um, that Dr. Kerr did, but is, are there any studies or information in regards to swine production efficiency in relation to foaming barns versus non-foaming barns? Well, I haven't seen any to that effect as long as we're not impacting uh, the health of the pigs and killing them when we have foam to that level. Um, Certainly, I've heard a few people hypothesize about how different uh, diseases might influence our gut flana. 
uh, in the manure. And I would tell you that there's some differences between what the pig is excreting and what we end up stabilizing as a microbial community in the manure storages. I'm not ready to rule out a link, uh, but we didn't study that in enough detail. We looked more at what was in the manure, uh, not how it tied to herd health. Uh, but I tend to think that that isn't uh, maybe the largest factor in why this is this occurs. It, it might play a role in some cases, so. Okay, thanks. Um, Aaron? Chuckle. Yes, go ahead. Um, going back to that diet question, uh, Maynard Holberg, who was department head down at Animal Science, he, he made the comment that there's a direct correlation between pit foam and the price of corn. Uh, were we, uh, the price of corn here four or five years ago when it was up in that eight, eight fifty, uh, a lot of people were in that 50, 60% of the diet was DDGS. And there may be some relation to that, uh, at that point in time, whereas today that level is half or so what the maximum DDGS in the diet should be. I think the other thing that we're kind of hitting a moving target here is that the ethanol people are doing a lot much better job of uh, separating and centrifuging out a lot of the uh, constituents of the materials that are in the DDGS. And one of those being the, is the long chain fatty acids, the linoleic, the oleic acid, as, which is also a precursor for soap, which may come back to our foam. So I think a lot of that's being removed before it goes into the diet, and that may have some play on it too. Thank you. Um, Dr. Plan, I'll stick with you. Um, at the, in your second part of your presentation, you talked about some safety precautions to take um, when you do have foam and just in general, when you are working with manure. Um, when you when you looked at the incidences of foaming, was there any relation to the ventilation within the deep pits or the, deep, the, the pit ventilation, the amount of ventilation or um, the use of it? I, I, think, I think there is, but we couldn't figure it out. Um, one of the frustration that we have as engineers is looking at an experimental unit. When we look at a barn, the animal scientists, the veterinarians, they see 11, 1200 experimental units each on four sets of legs. The unfortunate thing from our standpoint is we just see one, and that's the building. Um, there's just really not enough uh, observations to be able to come up with that uh, correlation between the agitation, the foaming, uh, the ventilation. Uh, but the flat out recommendation is never shut that ventilation off. We know there's gonna be a buildup of methane, buildup of gases if that, if that uh, uh, ventilation ever gets shut down there. Now, if the foam starts coming through the slats, our recommendation is to um, pump down, dewater, whatever you wanna call it, until the foam gets about a foot below the lowest point or the lowest part of the beam. Then you can start your ventilation in there to clean things up there. So, uh, but did we see any correlation between ventilation and foam? No, and that's probably just because we didn't have the number of observations. Okay. I'll, uh, we're nearing uh, two thirty now, so I thought I'd jump to one question. It's actually two people's question, or two people asked a fairly similar question. That cuts down to what do you feel is the cause of the foam. Yeah, one of the questions is. Um, do you know what is causing the differences in microbial species between the foam and non-foaming barns? And a little bit more general question is that any thoughts on which causes are more likely than others? So Dan, maybe if you want to take a crack at summarizing, summarizing that first and then Chuck, if you have anything to add, we can uh, go from there. I'd like to tell you, I can summarize it in one word, what causes the microbial change. The truth is I can't. What I can tell you is that higher carbon contents in the manure, uh, whether from better water conservation or diets that lead towards more carbon excretion, tend to develop microbial communities that lead towards foaming. But one of the things Chuck pointed out is that two barns on site, one may foam, one won't. Uh, they're being fed essentially the same diets. For whatever reason, there's a small difference between that pit that we can't identify, and we end up with vastly different microbial communities. Uh, one of the things we saw in our tank studies was exactly the same thing, right? If I started with an empty tank in the summer, I got a vastly different microbial community than I got in the winter. Uh, so there's lots of things that play into that. And I told you that diet 
covers maybe 50% of it. That means 50% of what causes their microbial community is variables we couldn't identify. Thanks. Uh, I, I really can't add to that in the fact that it's, I think if we had spent another five, 10 years, we probably wouldn't come up to the true cause. I think it's just one of those things that is just so complex, multiple factors involved. Um, when we're dealing with pits, we start in October and we go to October one year, there's a lot of things happen throughout that, that one year as that pit fills up and it changes. And, and uh, I know at one time we were pointing toward the protein, we were pointing toward long, long chain fatty acids uh, coming through in the DDGS, uh, various different types of, uh, of uh, finger pointing there, but we really didn't come up with anything definite. Right. Thank you. Um, there's a few more questions here. If uh, you have a few more minutes um, to stay on, I know some people will have to jump off. Are there any thoughts regarding the presence of detergents in swine, in, in swine manure or swine pits and, and tying that to the incidence of foaming? I'll throw that to either of you. Who's well, when we, when we did our survey, there wasn't anything that came out. And uh, the same thing when uh, with the microbial data and uh, Illinois did some work on that, they could not find a correlation between the microbial community and any of the detergents that were being used. Okay. Good. Um, I think we have one question here. I think it's a bit of a, a background question. What's the main reason for choosing deep pits over other types of manure storages um, in looking at both this cause and, and solution issue? Well, in in state of Minnesota, it's it's just flat out required to have the manure covered for odor control and gas control, and it's just flat out the best place is to put it under the animal. So all new construction over the last fifteen years or so have been deep pits. the uh, the other incident, the other reason for it is is that you don't take land out of production. So if you got eight, nine, ten thousand dollar an acre land that you can go to 250 bushel corn, uh, you really don't want to put that into a manure storage. So those are the two main reasons why uh, deep pits are used. Now, the construction costs, the operating costs are higher because of the concrete and the excavation, but that's the two big reasons. Right, so the, the presence of deep pits to begin with is a lot of um, regulatory and, and social and, and economic factors tied into them which vary across the country, depending on where we're from. So um, happens to be more deep pits in this area, but other storages elsewhere. Um, and then the foaming was an issue that was mainly seen in these deep pits, correct? Correct. Great. Um, one question, quick question is, will a recording of this webinar be sent out? A recording of this webinar, uh, as well as information that was presented in the slides will be available on the um, LPLC website. Uh, Leslie had posted the link earlier in the chat during the webinar, and I'm sure she can post that again for easier reference as well. Uh, let's see. Um, one question came in, and that's regarding the, the solution that was presented about adding monensin. Um, have, and I'll, I'll ask maybe this to Dan, has Iowa or Illinois been able to proceed with adding monensin at a lesser environment with a lesser environmental concern? Our state regulatory agency hasn't made any final claim on that. What I've been saying is there is a swine safe approved additive called Narison. It's basically pig rumensin. Uh, it can be put in the diet. It's a first cousin of uh, rumensin though, and you could feed that to your pig to uh, effectively achieve the same thing. And that was one of our diet studies and it, it does seem to work reasonably well for reducing methane production from that manure. Uh, there are some export of pigs to certain countries if you do that where you have some limitations, so that is something to be aware of. Okay. Thank you for that. Is the foaming similar to something that happens in ethanol distillation facilities? And that one would be a good question and one that I have a follow up. Are you talking in the uh, so Carl, are you talking in the uh, fermentation batch or are you talking during the actual distillation part of that where we would separate ethanol from uh, the water essentially? 
Yeah, there's probably a few parts to that question. So um, Carl, if you have some more, uh, he's added in fermentation. Um, if we don't quite get to the question, please just keep them coming and we'll answer it by text if we don't, can't get to it. But he is mentioning fermentation down. In the fermentation facility, it potentially would be because that is a protein-based foam as well, I believe. So there's probably some similarities, um, probably some differences as well, because they are more carefully controlling the bacteria community they get than what we get randomly. Um, a couple of questions about the bacteria. Why were the bacteria that are unclassified difficult to identify? Well, they're easy to sequence. I just don't know what that sequence really means, right? And if you look at manure, that's not uncommon to find lots of uh, bacteria that haven't been uh, really written about, right? Mm -hmm. They aren't uh, maybe commercially important to it at, at this time, so they haven't been explored as fully. So you get maybe some general class data. We just don't know specifics about that, that guy. Uh, so that means you can't always link them to what he's eating or what he's producing as a waste product. So that's what I mean when they're difficult to identify. It's not that we don't have a sequence. We definitely have a sequence and that was no harder to get than any other one. And it's kind of like building a library, right? We have information, but we don't necessarily have the library to compare it against. That's right. Um, are there any other foam treatment options out there? Well, I didn't show it in the slides that I talked about today, but uh, certainly in the slides set that will be shared. One of the things that uh, uh, Minnesota did was they did some denaturing of the protein through either heat or protease. Uh, my last two slides will focus on a study we did where we added Narasin directly to the manure or uh, a bacteria that we know makes a lot of protease. In both of those cases, we're able to reduce the amount of foam that formed on our manure storage, uh, shift the bacteria, and I would tell you that the one was a, a denaturing of the protein-based solution. So it, it was a different type of bacteria rather than an inhibitor. We were trying to change the bacteria population. I think that gets at one of the other questions that was, was in there about um, shifting populations in a way. Um, one question, would the protein in the foam be a clue with respect to a microbial excretion? Uh, maybe, and uh, one of the scientists at uh, the University of Minnesota, Bo Hu, tried to do some uh, protein work to get a better handle on the protein. Uh, what I would tell you is protein in manure is pretty dirty and it's hard to really tell which one's out there. Uh, so from what we have so far, I don't think we can make any uh, distinctive claim on uh, how that relates to the microbial population, uh, just that there's a lot of protein in the manure. The other thing I'd say is if you look at some of our dietary trials, uh, we could make that manure foam just by adding a tannin, so something to attach to that protein. Uh, so I tend to think that it's more just protein in general, crude protein, it doesn't really matter about the microbial part on that. The microbial part comes more into play on the polyliposaccharide, that's really the binding agent. Um, Chuck, maybe I'll throw this one to you. Um, water quality of the uh, water quality of the drinking water for the animals. Um, did that come up in in any of the survey questions or results? We we asked that in the survey, and we looked at it from a geographical region. Uh, I know in Minnesota that that uh, as you go across the southern tier, the farther west you go, the higher the sulfate concentration is in the drinking water. Uh, but again, we could not correlate that any, any way back to any type of foam on that. So is there a possibility? Maybe. Just that we just didn't have enough observations or enough uh, responders that could really clear cut to really pinpoint. Okay. I think we're uh, coming down to the last couple. There was a question, is there someone to help with this in Pennsylvania? I'm not sure if Rob Minan is still on the line. Um, if he wanted to put in some specific contact, contacts in Pennsylvania, um, that would be helpful if you can add those to the chat box, Rob. Otherwise, we'll provide some information by, by uh, text after the webinar here. A um, couple more questions about the, um, about the proteins. Were the proteins in the foam ionically charged? Um, did that affect their emulsion interaction? Um, is there some interaction at an electromagnetic level? Presumably they were, but uh, we didn't seem to find that as in, 
an important variable when we're understanding it. Uh, there have been some efforts to understand it, and I would tell you that we know proteins can serve as a surfactant at certain times. One of the things I didn't show is that when we remove proteins, we do change surface tension. Uh, how that interacts with the emulsion, uh, I can't say in great detail, but my guess would be that most of the protein that we're seeing is corn-based in the majority of our rations, and that protein tended to always be able to cause an emulsion based on what we did. Okay, I think I'll take one more um, comment question that actually came up more so in the um, in the chat, and it's related to the to the potential fat molecules in the manure. Um, the question is, wouldn't the fat rise over time in unoccupied barns versus being constantly mixed a bit with continual manure addition, and, and can that play a role? I think it certainly could, although normally when you think of fat foams, they tend to be more of that clear glossy foam. And I think we tend to see more of a gray brown foam that indicates protein. The one thing that we did tend to see in our studies is that uh, our foaming manures were more adept at breaking down that fat or those long chain fatty acids than our non-foaming counterparts. So that was one of the key differences microbially is just that they could eat that stuff a lot easier and turn it into methane. And I think that's just as important as the, the fat itself, probably more so. In uh, all the experiments that we did, Adding fat right away never caused foam. It was the breakdown of that fat. So something the microbial, microbes produced as they broke it down. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what should I eat for dinner tonight to ensure that my house does not catch on fire? Well, we appreciate everyone's levity uh, <laughs> and uh, other um, interesting um, analogies to other types of foods that came up in the chat. Um, I think your picture of a uh, meringue um, spurred some thoughts, but we appreciate the questions. We won't be able to get to any more today, but we do have them listed here and, and plan to answer them as best we can. Appreciate everyone's attendance and, and of course the questions. Thank you very much to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Clanton for their presentations and as well to the rest of your project team that worked on this really important issue. With that, I'll sign off and wish everyone a nice weekend.